Hi, welcome to my OCR AA level biology revision with me, Christine. Today's lesson, we're going to look at the cardiac cycle, which is module three, transport in animals. So to take us back, we need to consider the structure of the heart and to remember that the heart is made up of four chambers. At the top, you have your atria and at the bottom, you have your ventricles. Now, it's important to note that the atria have very thin muscular walls. That's because when they contract, they only need to squeeze the blood down into the ventricle. So it's not a far distance for it to go. However, what's important for us to know is that when the blood actually flows into the atria, the atria are not contracting, they are relaxed. It is a passive movement. Now, as the blood flows in from the vena cava and from the pulmonary vein, what's going to happen is a slight pressure is going to build up inside the atria. And what that will do is that will push open the atrial ventricular valves. That will push it open when the pressure inside the atria is greater than the pressure inside the ventricle. So therefore, both the atria and the ventricle are relaxing at this point. So this is when diastole is happening, when the heart is completely relaxed. This passive flow of blood into the atria and then when it's great enough pushing through the atrial ventricular valves and down into the ventricles. Now once both have filled up, atria, atria contraction occurs and that is where you have what's called atrial systole. This is where the blood is forced further into the ventricle and it will stretch the walls of the ventricle. Once the ventricles start to do their contraction, which is ventricular systole, that is when the atrial ventricular valves are going to close. Now, the key thing to remember about your valves is that the valves are there to prevent the backflow of blood. So when the pressure builds up and is great enough, that will cause the ventricles to close. If the pressure behind the valve is greater, that will force the valve to open. So when the blood is flowing through the heart, it's important that we understand this difference in the pressure. So when we look at the cardiac cycle, we need to understand the difference between atrial systole, ventricular systole and diastole. Now the first thing to look at here is called atrial systole. So atrial systole is where the atria are contracting at the same time and that is forcing the blood down into the ventricle. Now, as you can see from this diagram, the pressure in the left atrium is shown in blue is always greater than the pressure in the ventricle up until the end of atrial systole. Now, the minute the ventricular pressure is greater than the pressure in the atria, that is when we are in ventricular systole. And we can tell that because the minute the ventricle pressure gets greater than the atrial pressure, our atrial ventricular valve is going to close. And I have shown that on my diagram here, that at this point where my orange line crosses my blue line, that is where my atrial ventricular valve has closed. Now, if this is on the left side, we're talking about the bicuspid valve. If this was on the right side, this would be the tricuspid valve. But it's important to note that it's the atrial ventricular valve because it's between the atria and the ventricle. Now, as we continue through ventricular systole, as the ventricle is contracting, what we get is that the ventricular pressure increases and it keeps increasing until it becomes greater than the aortic pressure. Now, when the pressure inside the ventricle, because of the ventricles contracting from the apex, squeezing the blood and forcing it out of the aorta, that is going to get to the point where it's higher than the pressure above and this will cause the semilunar valves to open. So when we have our ventricular pressure greater than the aortic pressure, that is where the semilunar valve will open. And as the ventricle continues to contract, the ventricular pressure is always going to be greater. 
the minute the ventricular pressure drops below that of the aortic pressure, that is where our semilunar valve will close. So it's important to note the opening and closing of our valves is to ensure the unidirectional flow of the blood. We do not want blood to flow backwards. We need the blood to flow all the way through the systemic circulation, or if we're on the right side, the pulmonic circulation. We need that blood to flow its complete circuit. So therefore we need to maintain that pressure. Now, as you can see, as the ventricular pressure drops below the atrial pressure, that is where our atrial ventricular valve will open again. So this happens when the heart muscle is relaxing and that is called diastole. So if we move on then and think about, well, how is it that the heart is able to contract and contract in a rhythm? Well, this is to do with our sinoatrial node. So in the right atrium, there is what's known as a pacemaker. The pacemaker is going to set the pace of the heart rate. And therefore that is going to send electrical excitation along through the atria, causing the atria to contract at exactly the same point. So both the left and the right atria contract, forcing the blood down into that ventricle. Then you can see here that we have what's known as the atrial ventricular node. So the atrial ventricular node is going to pass that impulse down into the ventricles. It will pass it down through the bundle of his, then to the prechine fibers. So what we want is we want to ensure that the atria and the ventricle actually contract at different points. We want the blood to be forced out of the atria down into the ventricle first. So we want to have a slight delay. That is the role of the atrial ventricular node, to receive the impulse from the sinoatrial node and for there to be a slight delay before passing the impulse down through the bundle of his and through the prechine fibers. And to help that, there is actually non-conducting tissue between the sinoatrial node and the atrial ventricular node. And that prevents the impulse from moving directly into the ventricles straight away. So it ensures that the atrial ventricular node receives the information, but then there is a slight delay so that the atria and the ventricles contract at the right moment to ensure that the blood is pushed out of the heart at the right force to ensure it can complete the circuit. So to understand this then, we need to look at what's called an electrocardiogram, so an ECG. Now what that ECG does is it detects the changes in the electrical activity of the cardiac cycle. So there's very specific parts to the ECG that you need to be able to deter. So the first thing we need to understand is our P wave. Now the P wave shows us where there is atrial depolarization. That is where the sinoatrial node is sending the electrical impulse down across through both atria. So we call that atrial depolarization. And when you look at module five, neuronal communication, you'll learn more about atrial depolarization. Now, the next thing we have is our QRS complex. Now, our QRS complex is where we have ventricular depolarization. And it's important to note that after the P wave, there is a slight delay before you get your QRS complex. And then there's a slight delay and then you have what's known as the T. And the T wave is ventricular repolarization. Again, you'll learn more about this when you look at module five, neural communication. Now the picture on the left hand side doesn't quite look like the exact electrocardiogram that you would see in a textbook. However, this is a normal ECG trace. So it's important that you're able to distinguish what a normal trace looks like and what one that's showing some abnormalities in the heart muscle. So you have to be able to detect the difference between what a normal ECG looks like, and that's about 60 to 100 beats per minute, 
Bradycardia is where you have a slow heart rate. Now, bradycardia is where there is normally a normal trace. So you would expect to see your P wave, your QRS complex and your T wave, but you would have a longer delay between one T wave and the next P wave. Now, if somebody is actively fit and they are doing lots of exercise, then they could have a slower heart rate because they have a stronger heart muscle. So bradycardia is a normal trace. However, it can indicate a problem with the heart and with the sinoatrial node. So if somebody has bradycardia, it could be that they need a pacemaker because the sinoatrial node is not sending the impulses across the atria at the right rate. So bradycardia is a way of us seeing that the heart rate is much slower than normal, so that means it's less than 60 beats per minute. However, it is important that we take the information of the individual before making a diagnosis. Now, tachycardia is where you have a fast heart rate. So it's, again, a normal trace, but with a shorter delay between that T wave and the P wave. And that could be that someone's doing exercise. It could be that they've got a bit of a fever, so they're heart is working harder to pump the blood around to try and fight an infection. It could be linked to emotions like anger, excitation. So it's important to note that a fast heart rate isn't an indicator of a problem unless any of these things have been ruled out. You can have an ectopic heartbeat and that's where you get an extra heartbeat. If you have an extra heartbeat, then what you tend to find is, is there's normally a really long gap before the normal trace is then shown again. And if you have atrial fibrillation, that is where you have an irregular rhythm. And atrial fibrillation tends to be that there's no distinct P wave and the QRS complex is normally much narrower than would be indicated in a normal ECG trace. So it's important that you can determine these specific diagnoses if they give you a trace. So if you like this video, then please do click the like button below and subscribe to my channel. And if you are looking for some revision platform, then please do check out www.aiqchat.com. It is a program that has over 1500 multiple choice questions and access to an artificial intelligent tutor to help you gain that knowledge. So thanks for watching my video and please do subscribe.